So okay. it's so at this point I would uh, hand over the session to you. Sure. And um, I will stop sharing my screen and maybe Alexander, you can uh, uh, share yours. So, dear Kaiser attendees, welcome, welcome you to this session. I am Massimo Michel and I will play the role of session chair today. I will uh, shut up immediately myself and I will leave uh, the floor to the first uh, talk of today, that is Alexander, and they will, he will present us a learning of process representation in recurrent neural networks. The floor is yours, Alexander. All right. Yeah, thank you for this nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for joining the session, of course. So my name is Alexander, and I'm going to present our work, um, learning of process representations using the current neural network. And this was joint work with my colleagues Stefan Lütgen and Timo Nolle, as well as Max Mühlhäuser. So although the title itself may already explain most of our techniques, so to speak, I still want to talk about the details here. So let's first start with a little motivation about the topic itself. So in process mining, for instance, you always have some kind of process event log where you capture all the information that has been uh, recorded by your information systems. And in process mining, you basically take this event log as an input, and then you create, in, in, as the title of the session says, process discovery, you may quite create, want to create a human-centric process model. That's the one hand part. And there are lots of different approaches how to solve this. And on the other hand, there, there are also some other techniques. They may need a different uh, representation of your process or the things that, have you, that you stored in your event log. And these techniques may be some kind of machine-centric, uh, may need to, uh, a machine-centric representation of these uh, cases that you have stored in your event log. And this is exactly what we try to address here in our uh, research in this paper. So as I already mentioned, many process mining techniques may, for instance, also be discovery. There may be anomaly detection or trace clustering may all use some kind of representation of all the cases that you have stored in your event log. And additionally, more and more techniques may also want to include some kind of case context. So all, every additional information that you can attach to a case, you may want to also include this into your case representations. So for instance, that your approach performs better, or you also want to obtain new insights from this data. So, but it turns out that in most cases, or at least to a certain degree, you have to like come up with a known solution uh, that encodes your cases from the event log into a single representation. And you want to have a coding of those cases into a very condensed manner. So that's really hard to do manually. So, and you may also want to adjust for each and every event log, there may be different attributes that you may want to consider, but more importantly, you may have attributes that are of different importance. So for instance, there may be an attribute that may be of high information value for your case representations, and then there are other attributes, for instance, that may not be so important. So take this extreme example, if you just want to have, or if you have a random uh, attribute within your event log, and you want to get rid of that. So it's really hard to like come up with a manually crafted uh, encoding for that. Because you need to understand what's in your event log, as well as what your outcome should look like. And that requires, as a consequence, some kind of domain knowledge to really gather all this information. And this has been addressed in the related work already. So for instance, there's act to back trace to back and log to back which was introduced uh, at BPM conference. And it is inspired by the very famous two concepts of vert to back and doc to back from natural language processing, which we have seen in the session maybe earlier if joined. And there the main goal is to like take the sequence of activities of a single case and map it to the vector space, while at the same time retaining the semantic relationships. So for instance, if you have two cases that are very similar, you also want to map those cases 
close to each other in the vector space. And that's exactly what trace to vec, lock to vec, and act to vec does. We earlier this year we have extended this approach by case to vec, which includes like the event and case attributes as well. But it has some drawbacks, which we'll see also in our evaluation later. And then there's also other work, the works that is very similar to the ones that um, I'm going to present in a minute, which are based on recurrent neural networks. And here the authors use some kind of common sequence of activities, which they call the, the trace context, and use this information as for training. So they pick the longest prefix of all the cases in the event log and try to predict those from the sequence of activities. And of course, there are a couple of other approaches that I cannot talk about because of time constraints. So let's switch gear and uh, go into the details of what we did. Um, again, as the title says, we are using a neural network that is based on a recurrent neural network to learn those representation vectors for our event log. And we want to do it mostly automatically. So we do not have to like figure out what case attributes may be interesting and whatnot. We just want to have an approach that takes care of that. And it turns out that recurrent neural networks uh, work pretty well for sequential data. So we thought it would be a good idea to also use them in the sense or in the context of process mining because like sequence of activities are also very similar to natural language. However, a recurrent neural network performs best if you use its predictive power, whereas like representation learning does not necessarily have some kind of supervised learning task where if you explicit uh, target output that you want to learn from your neural network. So what we did is we um, transformed the idea of representation learning into a supervised learning task. And the idea is here really to make use of this predictive power of the recurrent neural network. And we make it such a way that we use the uh, sequence of activities uh, with its event attributes to predict the case attributes of our event log. And when, and when we do this, we can actually use the internal state of our recurrent neural network as the vector representation. So let me show you how this really looks. So here's a very basic um, overview of the approach itself. So you have an event log, of course, that consists of a sequence of activity like A, B, C, and so on. And you may also have additional uh, event attributes such as the resource. So in this case, it's Sam, Max, and Julia, and so on for each of the events. And these two things are then part of our input of our neural network or of our approach itself. And then on the other hand, we also have some kind of case attributes attached to each of the cases. And in this case, it's, for instance, the department that may be of interest here. And we use this as the, or connected to the output layer of our approach. So what does it really do? Well, it tries to compress all this information into a single, um, or we force the network to actually learn all this detailed information and it tries to compress it such that it can understand the dependencies between the sequence of activities, the event attributes, as well as the case attributes. And then we can just pick up the internal state of our recurrent neural network as our representation for each of the cases. So let me just open up the, the right hand side box to get a little bit more detail of how our network architecture looks like. You can see on the top side here, this is the input layer of our neural network. And on the bottom side, you see the output layer. So the input layer is just the, e the sequence of activities, including the event attributes. And an activity itself can be seen as an event attribute, so to speak. This will then be encoded, very, very uh, I would say, very common way of doing so as a one-hot encoding which is just a vector of ones and zeros. And then we try to, or we create an embedding layer for each of the uh, event attributes, which means that we encode those one-hot encodings again into a more compact form. And this compact form can be, of course, also set by size. You can determine if, there, if you want to have like more vector, uh, a higher vector size or lower vector size of the embedding layer. 
And then we fed in our, our sequence one after another, and these will then be concatenated into one single embedding, uh, into one single uh, layer, which is the concatenation layer, which concatenates all of our event attributes. And these are then the input our, of our recurrent neural network. We actually don't use the original uh, recurrent neural network, but more or less the long-term short memory or, and the gated recurrent unit because it has some advantages regarding like forgetting things alongside your, your sequence. What is interesting, you can again um, like determine how big or small your representation should look like, but just specifying the representation vector size. So the output of those uh, of, the, of the recurrent neural network is then simply connected to like um, the the output the the case attributes in this example like the category or doc type and so on. And again, this is the interesting part here where we just pick up the um, the representation of each of the cases. So let's see how this works all in practice. So we did some experiments uh, and did in our evaluation. So in our evaluation, we looked just at one single use case. Um, in this sense, it was like the subset identification. So it's like a clustering task that we were interested in. And we evaluated on two synthetic event data sets. So these are not just two event logs, but multiple ones with different um, properties like size varied, the noisy, the noise levels uh, were different and so on and so on. And then we also looked into how can we, uh, oh, how do we perform using real life event logs? And there we used the BPIC 2015 event log, which consists of five different event logs of uh, Dutch municipalities. And we also use the 2019 event log, which is a procurement handling process where we try to re-identify the document types. So the first two approaches are ours. So we use both. We have an LSTM implementation as well as a, a gated recurrent unit uh, implementation of our approach. And we compare it with a simple autoencoder, uh, the earlier mentioned trace to back, case to back implementations. Uh, we also compared it with our earlier work, uh, which also combines both a perspective like the sequence of activities as well as the data attributes in the hybrid cluster. And just as a bad baseline, we also want to look how we compare with just having a look at the sequence of activities or some kind of information that can be obtained from the sequence. So back of activities and the added distance. So we did two... Um, evaluation, so to speak. We evaluated the separation part, so how good is our clustering, and we measured the F1B cube metric, but we also looked into the process model quality, so if we have those subsets identified, we use a discovery algorithm to compute a process model, and from that we compute the, bit, the fitness, precision, and simplicity. You can see the details on the right hand side. Again, we have like our event logs that were encoded into this one hot encoding. Uh, for each of the cases, then we can uh, obtain a representation using our current neural network. And as a result, we get like a case representation for each and every case, which is then fed into the cluster algorithm where we also tested the agglomerative and k means cluster as our. Uh, yeah, cluster algorithm. And there we can see, okay, we have a discovery algorithm in this sense, it's like the very basic heuristics minor, which was just for, uh, due to performance um, uh, regards. So we can compute very quickly those models and then we compare it. We still think that the comparison itself should be okay-ish, although I would say we, we should also try it with more advanced process discovery algorithms as well. And then, as I said, on the other hand, we also looked into the subset identification task where we compared if our originally clusters that were put into the synthetic event blocks were also consistent to the output that our approach uh, delivered. So let's have a look at the results. And uh, we see here the results of the synthetic event blocks. And on the left-hand side, as well as on the right-hand side, we're just seeing the results of the subset identification task. 
Again, we have like the autoencoder, the uh, edit distance, the back of activities, the hybrid cluster. We compared it with the trace to vec, case to vec, with just an event attributes as well as both event and case attributes, and the two implementations of our, our architecture. And what we can see immediately from the figure itself that there are high variations between all the results here. So for all the other approaches that are very, uh, yeah, how, how would I say that the variance is very large, whereas compared to like the neural network approaches, they are very small. So they, the results are all very close to each other, although our data set contains very different event logs. So regarding noise level, regarding how many attributes we put into the event log or how many dependencies between the sequence of activities as well as the attributes are. And we still see that we are doing really good in identifying those subsets again. The details can be found in the paper, but I just want to mention here that you can see on the uphand side here that even for a little, uh, or for, for small number of the training epochs, you can also get very good results. So it's not that you need to train the network like long times to obtain very good case representations, at least for the task of subset identification. Um, let me also share some insights about the other uh, relevant in, um, evaluation, quality evaluations regarding the process model quality. So I marked the, uh, the results with the arrow here so you can get a better understanding uh, where our approaches uh, compare with each other look like. And again, for, for the subset identification, I, I say we, we're doing really good, even if we have a huge number of noise in the event log, uh, whereas other approaches may degrade in performance. For regarding fitness, I would say we are doing fine. We are not doing extraordinary good because, as you see, there are other approaches that do better, but that may be obvious because those are just considering the sequence of activities. And if you put in like very similar cases into a subset and just compare, uh, just uh, create a model from that, it may look better. That's probably the, the main reason why we. Uh, do not show uh, why we are not in the upper side of the, of the figure here. But I think it's pretty okay. And what's also interesting is that you may want to, uh, you may want to like argue that although we put in everything into our representations, we would drop in performance regarding fitness, precision, and simplicity. But it looks like that the neural network actually also captured the sequence still in the, in the case representation, which is quite nice. So let me also share some insights about our real life event log evaluation. Uh, I just want to mention the BPIC 2015 event log here, which consists of those five uh, municipalities that we try to like re-identify using just the uh, event log. So we've thrown everything into a single event log and then uh, try to like divide them again to those five municipalities. And what we also observe here that we are also doing pretty well here uh, is similar to the, F, uh, to the other measures uh, regarding the process model qualities. We are also a little bit lower than maybe some other approaches here. So that's very similar to what we expected from our uh, synthetic event log evaluation. So obviously there are some pros and cons with our approach. Uh, it just works if you have some kind of case attributes and they may also be of high quality. They need to be of high quality. Otherwise we'll just learn nothing and it doesn't really make sense to, to learn like random attributes, so to speak. Um, in the beginning, I mentioned that you may want to have like a, like a control about what attributes you want to give more influence to your case attributes and uh, to your case representation result. It is not directly possible to do so, but it automatically tries to find out which are the ones that are, that are of high information value. So we can actually uh, uh, consider this as well in our approach. That can be a pro, that can be a cons. I think 
it, it really depends on the use case. And as I showed you in the evaluation, it's not directly uh, optimized for discovery, but it still learns some kind of uh, representation here as well. So the pro is, of course, you can just throw in an event log and it will provide you with some uh, very high quality um, case representations, I would say. It adapts to all the event logs. So if you have multiple uh, attributes, it will consider this as well. And if it's a first like look into the event log, you just got it new and you want to have some insights about it and want to apply uh, some process mining me uh, methods that use case representation, it may be a good choice to start it with, with our approach here. So to conclude my talk, I've presented a novel uh, representation learning techniques, a technique based on recurrent neural network, and it obtains a compact vector representation of the cases. Um, the idea was to, instead of forming like an unsupervised learning task, we trained a neural network in a supervised fashion by including the sequence of activities plus its attributes and predict the case attributes. Now, evaluation in the sense of our uh, subset and identification, it showed significant performance improvement. But what we really would like to see is an evaluation for many other use cases because we think just using like the subset identification is not sufficient to say, well, our approach works really good. I would say it looks good, but we uh, definitely need more use cases here. So if you want to check it out, um, there's a GitHub repository. Scan the QR code or look into the paper and let us know what you think about it. And I'm now happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Very nice talk. Thank you. We have two. We have two questions from the audience uh, that, and uh, I will uh, probably you can read, but I will uh, repeat uh, loudly for everyone. The first one is a, a comment by Alessandra that say, "If you learn the representation by predicting an attribute, it won't be part of the original feature space from which the data will be mapped to create the new representation. Won't it lead to a big loss of information?" That can be that can be in, indeed the case. I think, um, as I said, it's probably depending on what you want to do with the with the representation itself. Of course, it will mix up everything into a single vector. That's true, and you can't distinguish it anymore. So that's very that's a good point. That I would agree that. So if you have an approach that, like needs to uh, know those uh, attributes again, then it's probably uh, not a good choice to, to do it with, with our approach, maybe. But I still think for many approaches or many, yeah, many tasks, it would still be beneficial, I think. But I agree that we will lose something too, obviously. Okay, so thank you for the fairness of uh, recognizing uh, a possible point of improvement, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is also Good another point. question. There is also another question from uh, Nungyen. Sorry if I make the bad uh, pronunciation. Let's say uh, he has a two curiosity. What is the dimension of the vector space and the input of the recurrent neural network in your evaluated use case? Um, which I think we we uh, we played around with the vector size of the RNN um, a little bit in our evaluation. You can find some details also in the paper, and I think I also presented something. I, I think it's in the round of uh, for 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 both event logs. It was like let me see if I find the slide again. Uh, maybe it, this one is a good. I oh, know that's not a good one. I think it is in the uh, real life event log. There we go. So you can see um, here we have the vector size of the of the RNN network layer. So it depends really on the approach. So and on the event log. So for BPIC 2015, we found that uh, 64 um, dimension of a vector size may be sufficient to capture uh, the data itself. It may also be less. So that really depends on 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 the on the on the event log as well as the uh, yeah, the use case. Okay, and how do you deal with the unbiased event? 
if any? Uh, we, we don't uh, care about that right now. So that would be something that we have to look into, I guess. So that's still something open to to improve here. Yeah, true. Good, good point. Okay. And so the very last question, because then we are getting out of space, there is one from Julian that says, have you thought about using regularization during the training to improve the vector space layout, like uh, variational autoencoders? Could be a possible solution? Maybe, yes. Um, we actually tried, as you see, we also implemented our own autoencoder thing here. Um, which worked not so good for for very uh, yeah for for many cases it doesn't really capture like the sequence so good so but I think it would be a good good extension to the approach to to have a look into that as well um, honestly speaking I think we tried it once but it just for the autoencoder and then we yeah say we, we throw it away because like the RNN really did. A great job in just using it with the regular uh, uh, architecture that we used. So yeah, something for future work, of course. And since the code is open, you you can have a look at this. Okay, there is a, there are other questions, but I invite the uh, the attendees to make you maybe on offline by email because we have to to be strict yeah, sure. on to be strict on the deadline. In any case, congratulations, because your talk raised a lot of questions that this is always a good sign, especially in online class, in online It's 14 hours. So now let's move on to the next talk. You, Mash, I think that you can share the, the video. Sure, yeah, sure, just in a second. Just a second, I just have um, no problem. So this should be okay, right? You can see my screen. Okay, yes. Okay. So the floor is yours, Masha. Right? Thank you so right. much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Masha, and I'm very glad that I have this opportunity to present our paper today. So we are going to talk about extracting process features from event logs to learn coarse-grained simulation models, or let's say more generally coarse-grained uh, process logs. So the, for the introduction, as we know, there is process mining techniques that we use the information from the real uh, information system, which, are, which comes from the real or real world uh, processes. And then we have these event logs that through this presentation, I will refer to as fine grained uh, event log because they are at detail level and they have all the details of information and events that has happened in our process. And then we have three main categories like discovery, conformance, and enhance enhancement. So generally we would say that if we have the process mining uh, techniques, we have two major uh, techniques inside these process mining area. And then we categorize them as backward looking process mining and forward looking process mining. So we put the discovery and conformance in the backward looking process mining, which could be as descriptive techniques as well, because we have the data and the data and the process has passed. And then now it's time to take a look and find out that what has passed previously. And then we have the other part of the process mining techniques, which are forward looking process mining. Uh, which goes to the second category and we call them in the category of the enhancement. And then there could be two types of the forward looking process mining, like prescriptive and predictive. So by backward looking process mining, we get all the insight and information from the process. And by forward looking uh, process mining, we want to put these uh, provided insight from backward looking into action. Now it's time to take action based on what we have learned about our process. So uh, what we propose here, so these are the techniques that I, uh, the categories that we consider here for our work that we have this backward and forward looking process mining. So if we want to take a look at the forward looking process mining or a couple of techniques that exist already, as, as I 
as I mentioned, we have prescriptive techniques as well as predictive techniques, right? And then in the prescriptive techniques, usually we refer to simulation. Why? Because there are the models that can prescribe your uh, process in the future. And most of the techniques that are already presented are like from the discrete event simulation, and then they require the in-depth knowledge of the process. In the predictive techniques, there are like these uh, prediction models that we mainly use the, for example, LSTM and neural network, and they are for uh, machine learning techniques, and they look like a black box. So we don't care to have a model like the prescriptive model in simulation, but still at the end, we have some information. So the next step, as I said, is to answer the question. Our work is focused on the simulation part or providing prescriptive model. But the problem here is that the, uh, most of the work that has been proposed are at detail levels and they're like discrete event simulation. But what we propose here to go one level up and to take this data and transform them in a way that we can still have prescribing uh, model, simulation model for our processes, while we are not at that much detail, which these led us to have a more uh, freedom to add external factors to our simulation and consider and uh, apply the high level decisions and strategic decisions uh, on our, uh, apply this strategical decision um, on our processes. For example, we have very common uh, example here that we, for the workers or resources that are involved uh, in multiple processes in the simulation or in the detail level of the simulation, they may be seem like uh, underutilized uh, uh, while they are doing more than like they are involved in multiple activities and they are like uh, overloaded with roles. So these type of techniques should be able, or this type of information and insight should be able to present it in our simulation models and should be, the results should be uh, find out and we should be able to answer the what if questions uh, for our processes at different level rather than detailed level. So as I mentioned that we have the process mine, uh, mining and then other side for forward looking process mining, the simulation techniques are going to help us. So we have the event logs, we have the process uh, model that is discovered based on the event log, and that this enriched process model is going to create for us the simulation model, and then the simulation model at the detail level can gener regenerate another event log, which are the new insider information that it provides for us. But the, as I mentioned, like couple of techniques or couple of aspects, it's not easy to get them from the fine-grained simulation models. So what we do here is, we want to take these advantages that backward looking process mining provides for us, like the, all the insights, but rather than using the same data, we just uh, change the shape of the data to represent the process in other ways. That this suits for the more simulation models and different type of the what if analysis. These are uh, here the sample of the related work that has been done, like the general idea that, as I mentioned, we have discrete event simulation or um, business process simulation, which mainly could uh, overlap a lot. And also we have Q-theory and also machine learning techniques that we do uh, and they are used uh, so far for forward-looking process mining or prescriptive process mining uh, in uh, this area. Our motivation is that we want to mimic, uh, discover a process which mimics the reality better, like having external factors or having the relationship inside the process variables, which we define. And also we want to be able to uh, explore more um, scenarios, like not easily uh, having the, for example, like the, just to give you an example, the tiredness of, tiredness of resources and their performance and the service time eventually is not considered easily in discrete event simulation of the processes. So what we want to do is we want to create these high level simulation models which here we use the system dynamics techniques, and then we use these high level simulation models to uh, simulate these situation and these scenarios. This is the general uh, transformation and the general motivation of this paper. Imagine this is the event log or the fine grained event logs over time, and then each row or each color represents a case, and the uh, uh, dots are the events. So generally we look at the data like this, but what we do here is we just uh, split the data 
in a specific period of time, and then we define systematically uh, different variables, process variables, and now instead of talking about the each single event or each single case inside the process, we talk about the each single period of time. So we talk about every day, for instance, for our process, or we try to find out or try the different um, scenarios for each week in our process and predict and simulate it for further um, days or weeks and so on. Then this data is transformed to something like that, which we call it course grain process log over time. And now here with this new log, I can talk about my process and say, okay, in the first row, which is the first day, how my process reacts. And this information later can be um, translated or transformed to different type of the modeling, like system dynamic, which I explain uh, later. So uh, I mentioned that for our work, after having these um, coarse grain process logs, we use system dynamics modeling, which is a type of simulation at higher level of modeling. And these higher level of modeling and system dynamic include, for example, different uh, diagram, which the main one we use here is stock flow diagram. It includes three main elements, stock, flows, and diagram. So just very simple example of a process that we can, can be created for uh, based on the system dynamics uh, technique. Uh, it can give you a good overview here. We have arrival rate as a flow. And then imagine that we take a look at our process each day. Now the, our process is processed in a hospital, and then we have the arrival rate based on the uh, days uh, in our coarse grained uh, process log, which is discovered based on the fine grained process log. So if we have one day, the first day we have 10 patients arrive, and then we have release rate, which is nine, for instance, then we can calculate the number of patients in the hospital per day, which is our stock in the middle. And also we have these variables, for example, the release rate of the patient, in the hospital is directly affected by the average time that the patient spends for treatment in the hospital, right? So we have these uh, modeling techniques that can simulate for us, but we don't care about single patients. These overloaded or these higher level of the uh, simulation helps us to, to um, apply more high level or statistical uh, simulation techniques. And also underlying these uh, flows and stuff, we have a different equation. And then you can see here that, um, for example, the equation underlying stocks is uh, shown here, that in each step of time, for example, in the third phase of our simulation, we can see uh, the number of patients that remains in the hospital. By playing around with the average, the average treatment time, and then uh, later we can see how many uh, patients in per day we can have in our hospital. So the main pro uh, framework that we presented here is uh, as follows. As I mentioned, we start from event log, and then uh, in the lower you can see we have different process mining techniques, which based on the insight we come up with the design choices. We project our event log based on the design choices. And then we have the projected event log, which is focused on the part of the process that we want to simulate or have higher level decision uh, making analysis. We have the projection on the time window. As I said, these time window are very important. Either there are one day, one week, and how they should be calculated or considered for each process. And then we have these projected, small projected event logs, which go into the performance function which consider, I could say, almost everything or every feature that for creating a time series type of the data or coarse grained uh, process log of a process based on the event log are considered systematically. And then these variables are formed and we have the data and the variables. And so far now we have the ST log, which is used for model generation and at the end for simulation. So the detail would be like that. Here we consider the process mining techniques in two categories, main categories like discovery, which the input is only event log, and conformance checking, which the input is the um, event log and the model. So 
at, as the output of these two general techniques, we have set of cases, set of activities, or set of resources. This is what uh, we, we can get from the uh, general backward looking process mining, right? And then all these are the insights that you can focus and make help you to provide you with a decision point to create your higher level um, log and at the end, higher level simulation model. If we want to take a look at that with an example, imagine this is an event log of a hospital that we have. Now we perform performance analysis. And as a result, we find out that the interesting point or the decision uh, design choice for us is the bottleneck in the registration activity. So we have RCA, and then A is focused on the only activity registration, which can also be whole event like, but just for an example, C is the, all the cases, and R is the, all the resources that are involved while we have the activity registration. The projection function receives the event log as an input, and as a result, we have the new event log or the projected event log with is uh, L prime. And as you can see here, we all have the activity registration. Now we, design, we decided on the design choice or focus of the process, which as I mentioned, it could be whole process. So there is no need to focus only on one part, but that's an option here in our framework. Now we have the L prime and uh, it's time to project on the time window. The L prime, imagine, is only the event log of the 30 days for the hospital, and then we transform it to the uh, smaller event log per day. So we have the time window projection function, and we have the time window as well. Time window here is one day. So when we want to uh, talk about the time window, you can see here we have also time window selection and stability test which we run the ARIMA model and SARIMA model to detect the best possible time window. For each process, it is different that we either one week or Monday is the best option. So here, we can receive uh, the else they want, even have these is small. Um, um, now we have these small, um, small event, event logs here, and then it's time to form all the possible features that can be extracted based on the time of our event logs. So what we talk about here is that most of the time in prediction techniques as well as simulation techniques, Feature extraction is very uh, arbitrary task. So people do it like randomly. But what we have done in this framework is that you can consider every possible feature based on a standard event log and then have them, all of them based on the period of time that you want to consider. These are based on the um, performance indicator, possible aspects, and aggregation function. So based on the, uh, if I start with the possible aspects, it's uh, very um, straightforward. We have for, uh, in our in a standard event log, we have cases, resources, and activities, as well as attributes for an event or for a case. So these are the aspects. The aggregation function are, can be sum, average, or median, or nothing, like now. And as well, we have the performance indicator. Based on the process uh, nature, we only can have the value of a variable, which can be the direct value, for example, for number of numerical variable, we can have count, we can have service time, waiting time, or time in process. So given this table, which we call it a validator, we form all the possible uh, features or variables for a process over a step of time, and there we just ended this having this arbit arbitrary um, choice of features for our framework or any, frame, any other framework that uses these set of features over a step of time. So if you want to see this variable extraction as well, so we see that uh, imagine that we have the one day
So we consider that we want to look at our process per day. We have all the resources as the whole process per day based on these uh, values, which is the um, average time that all cases spend in the process daily. These fee functions represent and calculate the data. And this is what we, at the end, we I fear we have some issue with the remote connection. We lost Masha. Let's wait one minute to see if she is, if she's able to reconnect, I would say. Okay, now he's getting back. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. So uh, can you hear me now? Yes. So sorry, I just continue. Um, so yeah, this is what the whole uh, framework that I was talking about, that we end up with this. This is the same data you could see in the event log, but this is the different way that now, when I talk about my process, I could say in the first day, this is the features that systematically discovered from the original event log, and this is the value. And then we have the same, for example, here, another example for the whole event log instead of one single activity. So if I want to uh, just conclude with the evalu evaluation, this is the some system dynamics model based on the event log that we discovered for BPI challenge 2012. And then you see that the highlighted one or the gray one are the one that we discovered directly from the event log without no uh, interaction. And these values are considered per day. And the extra one is the extra variables that I mentioned we can add to enrich the model and then to simulate and have the information on that. So if you took a, take a look at the simple, only this simple evaluation or model that is created based on the SD logs or these coarse grained logs, we can see, for example, we have the process efficiency, which is for us very important per day. And what the variable that are uh, affecting that is the process active time, as well as product, process productivity, which comes from the desired finish rate. So you, as a process manager say that I would like to have uh, 100 case finished per day. So we have finish rate, a finished case here. And this is the desired case. And these interactions just playing around, for example, simply with this desired finish in this simulation model can help you to discover uh, how many resources you require or how many, um, uh, how much the service time should be as well. So for only this simple uh, model, you can uh, simply investigate four different evaluation scenarios, as you can see. So just see, uh, for instance, we had these uh, evaluation. Before we go for analyzing and investigating the evaluation, we should make sure that the model is valid enough. How we do that, we simulate based on the, here in this image, we only simulate based on the highlighted one because the value already calculated and we know them. So we have the base to compare the simulation result to that. Here you can see, for example, this is for the value of the stock, the number of the cases in the process per day based on the one that we simulated uh, using our model and the one that we had for the um, uh, simulation and the event log or the SD log. And this is the one that the scenario that we apply that for a unique um, resource, if I go back here, here we have the number of unique resources that your process require. And this is dynamically um, set or assigned based on the number of arrival rate and the number of missing case from the desired. So this is the value that if you um, only want to address uh, 90 uh, cases per day, 10 more cases per day, you require like around uh, 
percent of increase in the number of resources per case uh, per day that you have. This is another sample scenario that we have. This is for organization. So as I said, we have the different aspects. The SC logs or the course grain logs are discovered for two uh, even two organization in our process and their interaction. And then you can uh, see and simulate the exchange of the resources based on two organization based on their arrival rate and their finish rate. So to conclude my work, I would say that uh, we systematically find out uh, or design the framework uh, with an application that you can have an event log and then at the end you can transform that event log to different type of event logs or course grain process log that you can see your process still with the same value but in different shape and uh, shows you different insights. You are able to design different models and not only the system dynamics models, which we use here to evaluation, it can be used for any time series analysis or any prediction models that you want to uh, train. And then you can uh, see foresee, uh, foreseeing your process in the future. The next step that we want to follow is that we have to focus on the underlying equation if we want to stay with the system dynamics modeling uh, instead of relying on the resources or user knowledge. And the other drawback that I could mention is that, for example, we require for most of the simulation stable behavior. If we look at the ER, uh, emergency room of the hospital, it's not so easy to discover the arrival rates uh, which are per day uh, const uh, like uh, stable behavior, like the arrival rate or service time based on the cases could differ uh, a lot. So this is one of the challenges that we are uh, facing when we are, uh, we are using system dynamics, but still the value of the uh, discovered values in the silogs are valuable and could be uh, used for further analysis. Thank you for your attention. The project is very um, easy to use, UI-based project, which simply you can upload the event log and receive the silogs. And then uh, we are uh, happy that if you use that, and then um, if you have any question, I'm glad to answer your question. Thanks, and again, sorry for the uh, connection problem. Thank you, Maza. Thank you so much for your nice talk. And don't worry, we, I think that we were able to uh, follow it very clearly. It was all a minor disruption. Um, I don't see questions from the audience, so uh, I, would like to, um, I would like to make one question to you. That is, uh, uh, can you, probably you told and uh, due to the issue I missed it, can you highlight in which is the novelty of your approach over more traditional approach or process mining, let me say? I, I got the intuition that is the use of system dynamics, but if you want to provide an intuition to a person not so inside, can you phrase in a few words where is the, the, the differences? Yes. So uh, the main one, um, actually we use system dynamics as the evalu evaluation and it could be used for different techniques as well. But the main evaluation, uh, the main innovation is that we transform the simple event log to the different type of log, which is still represent the same data, but in different shapes. So this will reveal more information. So for example, we transform normal event log to the daily log with different attributes or features of the process. And then here we can easily discover if the workload of the resources has impact on the speed of them. And this relationship based on the data that we transport can be easily seen, which is not easily seen in the normal event log. So this transformation and higher level of simulation is the main point that we have done in this paper. Okay, so in a one word, you are making your event lock more discoverable, let me say somehow. So you are- Exactly, you are we change the shape of the event lock, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any other questions. So it's, uh, despite the issue, we are still on time. Thank you, Maz, again for your nice talk. And at this point, I would uh, like if Jean can start preparing for his talk. Yes. And so I leave the, the floor to you, Jan. Yeah, thanks a lot, Massimo. Um, in the previous two talks, we talked about specifics of process discovery 
In this talk um, that I worked on together with Artem Poliviani, um, Bart van Wensveen, Mathieu Brinkhaus and Hajo Rijos, is more on a meta level of what is process discovery and what are the, the guarantees, the properties that we would like to have for process discovery techniques. So to illustrate this, so typically what we do is we have an event log and then we discover some kind of model. Right? That is the basis of uh, process discovery. And then we want to know how good is our um, result in the model. And then we compare the log and we compare the model with each other. And then we have different types of, of uh, mechanisms to, to, to evaluate uh, the well-known four dimensions of generalization, precision, fitness, simplicity. That's the way how we interpreted this. But the goodness this way is determined by an external measure, namely the event log, and not really by the internals of the algorithm itself. And that leads to all kinds of interesting questions. So suppose I have this event log and um, it generates another one and there's this big system that generates this event log. And over time we have one event log, here we measure and then we record again, we get a new uh, event log and want to apply the results again. And now the question is, how can we compare the results? So how relatable are the results of those process discovery techniques? And that's something that we call internal validity. Yeah, so what's the in internal validity of process discovery? So if you repeat the, the whole process again on new observations, do the results agree with each other? So that way we wanted to get a kind of an understanding of how good is our, our process discovery and if we apply it, how confident can we be in the results of process discovery? So we would like to have this type of, of guarantees. And one way to, to look into these guarantees is to say, well, there's some kind of true process, might be unknown, we don't know yet, and it generates this event log. And this event log then um, is used uh, to discover a process model and then we're interested in what's the quality of it. How does it, this discovered process relate to the true process? So one way to, to do this is if we have the, 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 the true process and we have the event log, well, we can measure how good um, the event log is compared to the true process. And we have all those measures, precision, fitness. So we can calculate it for the event log with the true process. And what we would like to have is that if you start comparing your discovered model with these uh, precisions, etc., you would like that this precision of your true process is similar to what you discovered. So the better the event log is, or the, the better your algorithm is, the closer your, um, your qualities of the discovered model become. And so you would like to have some kind of guarantee that the discovered qualities approach the real qualities. And that's the ideal case what you would like to have. But of course, this is only an ideal picture and this doesn't really work because it's not just one event log. We have many of those event logs. And how do you compare many of them? So we were thinking on how can we create more guarantees? How can we start looking into hey, this approaching uh, values? How can we improve the internal validity? How can we think of this in process discovery? So that's, that's why we came up with a kind of a, a framework. And then we just say, well, suppose we have an event log that this is the true source. And we take different samples of it. So we just take a sample and another sample and another sample. And then what's the quality of those models? Should those models agree? Or how do these, these uh, values agree? So that means there's some kind of true process that generates this event log and then that we want to measure. And so we have this true values for the event log of the true process. And then if we sample, then we get another value and we want to relate those. And now because we have a truth model, we have this event log L that we know that we sample from, then we can start looking into what's the error of our sample. How close, how good is our sample with respect to this event log? And that way we can start saying things like, well, if our sample is of better quality with respect to the, the, the big event log, then we should also discover a better model. That would be the ideal case eh, for, for process discovery because that way you could say, well, if we have a good log, then we will get a good result. And if you get a better log, you will even get a better result. And that's a guarantee that you would like to have. So that's what I wanted to, to discuss a bit more in this talk. How can we do this? How can we think of this? But that means that we also need to discuss about what is sampling in process discovery? 
And how can we use it to evaluate our results in, in, in process discovery? That also means that we have to rethink how do we design our algorithms? What guarantees do our algorithms offer? How do we think of this? And can we put this in a larger context of internal validity of our processes? And if we do it this way, then what are the consequences of doing it this way or thinking more in terms of the guarantees of our process discovery algorithms? So those are the three steps that I would like to take in the, the remainder of this presentation. So I would like to start with sampling. So what is sampling? How do we think of this in terms of process discovery? And so let's move to the sampling part. We have an event log and we can generate a sample out of it. Well, one way is, is to do this uh, using all kinds of probability sampling techniques. And so the easiest way is to do simple random sampling. And so we have an event log, a collection of traces, and you just draw from them with a predetermined sampling ratio. It's a very simple way of random sampling, but it's random. And that means that we can start applying statistics on it. So that's one way of looking into it. You could also say, well, we have different types of, um, of, of, of traces in, in, in our system. Yeah? So, so we have very frequent traces, we have less frequent traces. And somehow, if you do sampling, we want to preserve this, or we want to preserve certain properties in the event log. Then you move into stratified sampling. Yeah? So we divide the traces in unique groups. We call those group strata. And then for each stratum, you apply random sampling. And that gives another random sample for which we can have all kinds of nice properties from statistics. So a simple way to, to define st uh, strata is by looking into the frequencies of, um, of events, uh, of, of traces. How often does a trace happen? How, how often does it occur? And based on those, you can start grouping. So that's one way of looking into it. You could also have more uh, advanced uh, algorithms to do clustering on, uh, on, on traces. But let's suppose just do it simple and just say, well, let's use the occurrence, the frequencies of traces for uh, sampling. And then you can say, well, we take a random sample. Eh? So we take for each uh, sample or for each trace that is in there, we take uh, the ratio of the elements that are in there. The only problem is if we do this, then a stratum can become too small. So that means that it, it might be that it is not present in any sample because it's just a too small uh, uh, item in, in, the, in the list. So just stratified sampling requires a little bit of, of tweaking. So one way to tweaking is what we call stratified squared. And basically what we do is we then, uh, we do a stratified sampling, but all of the uncovered strata are taken together. And um, based on the frequencies of those strata, we add sequences until we reach the expected number of, of uh, traces in sampling. And so there are different ways we could do this sampling. And if you do the sampling in, in a good way with statistics, you can start applying statistics on it. So if we start to apply statistics on our samples and say, well, this is a good sample or, well, it is a random sample, how good is it actually? Then we can start looking into the error of a sample with respect to the population, because we know the population, that is this event log L that we draw from. And so we have a known population, we have a known uh, samples, so we can start calculating errors. So if we consider an event log as a collection of traces, and the sequences of events, um, then what do we see? We see that most mining algorithms rely on the directly followed relation. That's when the alpha miner, the heuristic miner, uh, the inductive miner, my own ILP miner, they all rely somehow on this directly follows relation. And activity A is followed by activity B, and we use it in some kind of um, advanced way to discover new algorithms. So that means that if you consider these pairs as hey, your, your minimal animal element that we, uh, that we look into, then you can also start saying, well, that is our behavior. So we consider behavior to be the pair of activities that occur consecutively. Basically, the edges of the directly follows graph. And if you consider it this way, you can start counting. So you can, we have the, the original event log. We know how many of those directly follows pairs of, uh, we should have. We have our sample. So we know how many of those we have in the sample. And then we can start comparing. So this gives all kinds of ways to define error measures on our sample. 
And so, so the easy way is to look into coverability. And so it's each uh, directly follows pair of the sample also in, or of the event log also in sample. And so a complete covered means any uh, pair that we saw in the event log is also in the sample. And so you could say this, this coverability is what we classi classically call completeness of the event log for the alpha minor and for uh, the inductive minor. You could also say, well, I'm not interested in just coverability, but I also want to take into account their frequencies. And so you, you get a deviation in the number of occurrences. And then you can say, well, how do we measure this? You can do this in, in absolute values. And then we, for example, you can use the normalized mean uh, and we, or the root mean square errors. And so those help us in defining uh, the error measures. Or you could use the, uh, the percentage errors, uh, so the symmetric absolute percentage, or the, uh, take the root mean square of those, make it symmetric and take the percentage. So those are all ways we can use to compare the event log with our sample. So that way we know a little bit more about what is actually the quality of the event log that we are studying in our process discovery algorithm, because we know it's a sample and we know how it works. So if we know about the sample and how it works, how can we use this in the bigger framework? How can we use this in the stages? So that's the next part that I want to talk about. So what are the implications of considering event logs as being samples of some bigger population or another event log? So how can we think of the algorithms? What happens with the algorithms? How can we design them? And what should we look into when we design them? So what are the implications actually? So what, what we see is if we generate all those elements, what we want to have is um, that we can compare those. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is if those do not agree with each other. So we have an event log, we discovered some, uh, a model, we have a new event log, discover a new model, and the results do not agree. Then why do the results not agree? And so what causes the differences in the results? Is it due to a different sample quality, which we can measure because we have event logs. We can somehow compute and abstract and say, well, the sample quality of the first one is better than the second, so I choose the first result. But what if it's not about the sample quality, but it's something caused by the algorithm? How do we know that this difference is not caused by the algorithm, but that it is because of the input that we have? So that requires another way of looking into our algorithm. We want to have guarantees about the property about the algorithm if you give it proper input, we want to have proper output. And how do you think of this? So we want to, to, to have some more guarantees on the relation between input quality and output quality. So how can we do this in a framework like this? How can we think of this in our algorithms? So we were thinking about this and we came up with four stages for process discovery algorithms. And we can identify, if you look closely to, to process discovery algorithms, and a first point that always should be covered is that our algorithm is well designed. And with well designed, we mean that there's a proper introduction of the algorithm, that we know the class of models that, that come out, that we have some kind of property that we can prove. And so for the alpha minor and for the inductive minor, we have rediscoverability. For the ILP minor, we have guaranteed fitness. And so the algorithm is well designed with some kind of property. And most, I would say, I, I think we can say all process mining algorithms that we use in academia that we find papers about are all well designed. So we all do this. A second step then is the algorithm being used on real life examples. So how do you do the evaluation of your algorithm? And here we already start to see some more deviations. And so for example, my own ILP miner, we never validated it on real life examples. The algorithm is intended to show some properties and what would happen with those properties. So we look into the properties of the algorithm itself and not really on is it usable in real life examples. And that's the same case for the alpha minor. Whereas for example, the inductive minor, the genetic minor, they have been used on real life examples. So there has been done some validation on well-known benchmarks. And typically when we read papers, we see uh, discussions like, um, we have an algorithm and look, it improved on these properties in our event logs or in our benchmark of event logs. So we do validation. 
But the next step that we would like to, to see is more, what is the relationship between log and model? Do we know when it does our algorithm give a good result and when will it give a worse result? Do we know how, what the relation is between those? How can we study this? And actually, if you start looking into papers and start looking into what are the algorithms doing, then this is a stage that we are not yet at with process discovery. So can we study this? How can we study this? How can we give these types of guarantees? And can we do this then in a controlled setting? And so can we have some controlled settings where we know the whole situation? Do we actually get better models if we get better uh, samples? And so that's a study that we can ask. And similarly, if we know in a controlled setting what, that it works, does the algorithm also work in uncontrolled settings? So if you just give it a benchmark, can we say something about the effectiveness? Can we say something about yeah, how sure, how reliable are the results? How robust is our algorithm in a way? And so that's what we call uh, effectiveness of the algorithm. So the first two stages that we are, could identify, th that's typically what we do when we do process discovery. So in the remainder, I want to focus on the third and the fourth stages. What is this relationship between log and model? And what does it mean that the algorithm is effective? Can, can we discuss this? Can we maybe quantify this or move towards quantification of those properties? So if we again look to this schema, then what we would like to know in a controlled setting is, do we know something about the relation between those? And so if we know, we can start looking into an hypothesis saying, well, if the sample, the sample S, let me put the pointer on. And so if the sample, if this quality, so the error of this, the, the, the sample reaches the perfect score, and so the sample is as good as the original event log, then what do we know about the quality of our discovered model? Does this, this quality approach the quality of the true process? And that's a hypothesis. And if you know these values, we can start testing them. So we can start designing uh, experiments where we can test this hypothesis because we have this controlled setting and we can start looking into, does this happen? And if you know that if your event log approaches this uh, perfect quality, that also your model gets better and better and better, then you can also ask the next question. And that's what we call the second hypothesis. If I have two samples and my sample S1 has a better quality than sample S2, then does it also imply that the quality of the discovered model on the first sample is better or higher than the, that one of the second sample? And again, because we have a controlled setting and we know how we constructed our sample and we have this error measure, we can start quantifying this and we can design a controlled experiment to actually test this hypothesis. So we move a bit more to the, uh, the scientific methods, having falsifiable hypothesis, stating something about the relation between the input quality and the output quality. So that's the idea that we, we, we explored. And does this work or not? So we took an experiment. Eh? So, so how does an experiment like this then look like? Well, basically, an experiment in a controlled setting would be something like generate a model M, generate a log for that model, determine the quality of the event log and, um, and, and um, the, the original model. So we have some kind of true values. And then we can repeatedly draw a sample from this event log, calculate hey, what is the error measure of the sample with the event log, discover a model, determine the quality of the discovered model from the sample, and compare those with the original values. And then we can start looking, um, and then we can start testing whether there's uh, a correlation between the error measure, the, the, the error measure E, and the quality. Does the, if the error goes down, does the quality go up? That, that would be something very natural to test. And in such a controlled setting, we can do this. So we tried this for the inductive minor. And so we took the inductive minor from the, the prompt framework and um, we, we uh, extended it. So we, we uh, created a, a sampling framework and we generated 10 random process trees. And the process trees had 15 activities. And for each of those models, we generated a single event log with 5,000 traces. Then for each of those um, traces, what, what did we do? We, we, uh, we, we draw some samples. 
So we decided to set a sampling ratio uh, or 12 sampling ratios, very small with 1% up to 90% so that we have the full scale of our uh, sampling uh, ratios. And then for each sampling ratio, we took 10 samples. We discovered a model for each of those. And then we start comparing the results. So can we actually test our hypothesis? And then we have two hypotheses. The first one is if, if the sample approaches perfect quality, does the output quality also improve? And the second one, if we have two event logs, um, if one has a, a better quality than the other, then is the output also better than the other? And so those were the two hypotheses that we tested. Um, here you see the results for precision and recall. So we used Entropia uh, by Artem and uh, Anna to calculate precision and, and recall. And if you look to those graphs, then you see indeed that, um, and so here we, we see that this is the, the, the ideal case. And indeed what you see here is if the quality gets better, yeah, so the, the darker these dots are, the higher they are. And so for precision, we see that this, the hypothesis is true. So indeed, if the sample approaches perfect quality, then the value comes more closer to the, the, the expected value. So yes, we have this property. For recall, unfortunately, we didn't find this property. The recall was, was always uh, quite high of the models. So the sample, so the, the, the hypothesis was not true, but the results were, were, were quite good and accurate. So there we don't have a problem. Precision looked good. So we could accept the, the hypothesis. For the second hypothesis, so we again uh, um, calculated correlations, uh, the, the, the Spearman uh, rank correlations, and everything in precision was very accurate. So, so there was uh, correlation with, with high uh, confidence. For recall, there was not. So again, we could accept this hypothesis for precision, not for recall. And what this example shows is that this framework where we have this controlled setting and we know a bit about the error measure and we can start combining those is that we actually can, can conduct those type of experiments. So we can really start saying something about um, what is the, um, the quality and does the quality improve? So what is this relationship? And what we see for the inductive minor is that for precision, this works very well. For recall, it's more difficult. So we get a better understanding of what are the results of the inductive minor and how can we interpret the results of this minor? So doing this type of controlled experiments helps us also in understanding a bit better what is the algorithm doing. And for the fourth stage, the effectiveness of the algorithm, we, we have a slight problem because in a way we don't have this true process. And so if this is the algorithm, we can't um, do the true process. So, so we don't have the true process. We just have event logs. So you could say, well, let's get a, a, a benchmark of event logs. We draw a sample from each log in the, event, in the, the benchmark. We calculate the error measure compared with uh, the big event log, discover the model, and do again the whole experiment. And that way we get some more confidence in if we don't know the true process, what happens and how does it look like? And if you do this for the inductive minor, right, so, so the only hypothesis we can test is about uh, sampling quality. If we do this and we, we took two random sample or two random event logs that were better, uh, quite well described in literature, being the road traffic fine log and the sepsis log. And we start applying the whole techniques again. And so we, we conducted those experiments again. And then um, what we do see for, for both of those logs is if the ratio goes up, also the quality goes up. And so um, the red lines here is, is uh, the coverability. So the higher the ratio, the higher the coverability, which is what we expect. And also the higher the, the, the sampling ratio, the lower the error is. So in that sense, sample quality, eh, indeed the ratio goes up, the quality goes also up. It's what we expect. Um, however, if you start looking into precision and ratio, so what's the relation between the precision value and the sampling ratio? And then we see a curve like these. Eh, so, so there is no real correlation between precision and the ratio. And similar, if you start looking into uh, precision with the error measure of coverage, so we, we check precision against coverage, and we compare the, all those elements, then again, 
we see that there is no correlation between the precision and the sampling quality. And this is not only the case for uh, coverage. Eh? So we, we checked precision against all of the error measures that we, uh, that we proposed. And every time we found that there was no correlation between precision and the sampling quality. So that means in a way that we don't know if the sample goes up, if the result is better, or the, sorry, if the input is better, that also the output is better. We don't actually know for this algorithm. And again, eh, so for recall, we even found a, small, a slight negative correlation. It was also small, but it was a negative correlation, meaning if the quality goes down, the recall went up. How do you interpret these results? Does it mean that the inductive minor is something we shouldn't use? Well, of course not. It's, it's a good minor and we all use it. But how do you interpret this? And how do we know a bit better on what happens if we uh, comply the algorithm? So how do you think of this? What does it mean to do this? And so if the hypothesis is falsified in the experiment, then does it mean that we need to improve the algorithm? Or actually, does it mean that we need to have some kind of algorithm specific quality measures? So I took a random E in a way. So I, I just took these are the error measures and this is how I compare event logs. But actually, how do you measure this? And um, well, the inductive minor is shown to be, uh, is, is proven to be correct under assumptions of the event log. But how do we test those assumptions on the event log? Well, basically that is what I call the E, the error between the event log and the sample. So you could also say, well, instead of improving the algorithm, I need to improve my error measure. And that way you get, a, again, a better understanding of what's the input and what's the quality of the output. So falsifying a hypothesis doesn't mean that the algorithm is bad. It just means we need to think again, what is quality and how can we make better measures of those qualities in order to establish this relationship. And we think that this, if you start applying this type of, of um, mechanisms is that we can really make a next step in uh, process discovery so that we start to know and start to establish uh, well-known results that we can start to talk about how reliable are the results if we compare models um, those discussions we never ha really have in process discovery at the moment and we think we should really move to that step again so what does it mean what are the consequences the consequences are that we need to rethink our own algorithms what's the stage of the algorithm so my own ILP minor is on stage one. The inductive minor is already somewhere in stage three. Probably if we improve the error measures, we can even move to stage four. But that way we can start looking into the algorithm, start looking into comparing them. We can start to, to, to discuss if you want to have a certain property, which algorithm do you use? Why do you use that algorithm? So we hope that this way we can um, stimulate the, the, um, the community to start thinking in what are the properties of our algorithms and how do we establish those? How can we rethink and discuss how good our algorithms are and when to use which one? So we hope to open the discussion this way with, with this paper and um, we hope that all of, us, of you would have the, the, your own discovery algorithms that you also start looking into what are those relations and what are controlled experiments in order to improve our algorithms and the understanding of the algorithms that we have. So. That's what I hope with this talk. I hope we can all find more guarantees in our process discovery and I hope that you all help. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for your talks. As you said, let's open the discussion. We have for sure two questions. The first one is from Martin and then there is one from Adriano. So Adriano will do himself because he cannot write in the chat being a panelist. As far as the one of Martin, I will let I will, uh, um, I will read you. Assume that we have a, a prescriptive process model as discussed earlier, for example, during the MASHA presentation. How would you validate the discovered process model if the true process hasn't been implemented in real life yet? For example, the available end locks are generated during a system pilot version. Um. If you want to study um, when you don't know the true process, then you actually you're already outside of your controlled environment. And I think we should this first 
um, discuss much more what, what, what is, um, the, the, hey, if we control all this, do we understand the problem? Do we understand what the results are? And only then move towards um, parts that if we don't know the event lock, how can we do this? Or if we don't know the true process, sorry. Because otherwise you're, you're actually doing the, this uh, stage four experiment where you only have event logs and draw different samples of them. So my approach is if you don't know the true process, then can we draw some samples and can we somehow discuss when is one sample better than another sample? And only if you start to establish that relationship, then you can start looking into, okay, do I get better results or not? So okay. you really have to think of then how does the experiment look like? What is the type of experiment that I would like and how does the hypothesis look like? And do I have all the uh, variables? So here you really need to think of what is the error measure? And I really propose a few of them, but they are very general. And probably for the algorithms, you need very specific error measures because you have specific algorithms. Okay, then I would say to Adriano to have this question. Yes, thanks Jan for the talk. Uh, it was actually extremely interesting and also I would say quite explosive. You know, we don't have much time to discuss uh, a lot about this, but just a very quick question. I don't understand why you were surprised by the results you got within that admire. I mean, in that admire by design strikes always very high fitness, uh, while precision is always a matter of uh, the roll of the dice. And uh, um, I mean, this is, uh, by design, because in that manner it tries to discover block structured models. So anytime you have an event log or a model that is not block structured, there is an underlying approximation and you pay that approximation precision. So why you were surprised of finding out what you found out within that mm -hmm. I mean, it was almost like straightforward by the design because all yeah. the process discovery algorithms have some guarantees by design and that's uh, basically written in the research papers so i i don't know I, yeah. I think i missed a bit the point so i was not surprised to see those results but i but what i did like was that for the first time or at least for my for the first time it was very explicit and you can discuss those results and you um, of, and of course it's in the back of your mind because i know the papers but if I discuss this with, with practitioners, they often don't really know those, those properties or what is actually happening. So many of the assumptions we leave um, implicit in the papers. And what I hope with this type of controlled experiments is that we also make it a bit more explicit. What are those properties? And show that it really holds. And um, especially with with, uh, with with the recall, yes, of course they're, they're high and they're, they're all on, on, on that side because that is how it is designed. But that's an explanation of why you see the graph. Okay, so the, the graph matches the expectations. Whereas for some of the other graphs that we had, um, I was a bit surprised because apparently some, some times it's really the case that if you just happen to have one of the other traces in it, you get a completely different result. So how strong is your algorithm against robustness? These types of questions you would like to, to, to answer in a more structured way. And what, what I hope with this framework is that we provide some means in order to do this more structuredly, more systematically. Okay, thanks. Okay, we, I think that we have the time also for the last question from Giacomo. Giacomo says uh, you can read also yourself in the question answer. Leaving aside the probability sampling techniques in the eARC and possible implementation bugs for the algorithm, is it theoretically possible to provide an overall assessment of the algorithmic guarantees independently from the availability of a so-called true process? The question is related to the fact that it might be possible to design exploit a dot true processes that are never exhibiting the undecided, undecided algorithmic properties, 
Hudge has yes. in hand control the experimental, while on the other hand, the properties of the argument should not be necessarily determined by the data that you have for your experiment. Yeah. No, that, that, that's completely true. And that's why we differentiate between stage three and four. That's why we say, well, you first have to look into it if you know the true process, because in a way, then you can start looking and get some more confidence in the, the qualities of, of your uh, algorithm. And in order to make sure that you're not cheating the control experiments, we have the fourth stage, the effectiveness. Because there we don't have this true process, because sometimes the true process is not even possible to, to, to model. Then you just have event logs, and then you still want to know a bit more on when do I get good results and when do I get worse results. And for many of the miners, we don't know when we get good results and when do we get worse results based on the event log. We know it from a theoretical point of view. We know that if the event log is complete, then. But how do you assess the event log in order to apply a certain algorithm? I think that is the bigger question we need to ask ourselves. How do you know when to apply an algorithm and how to rely on the results? And when can we rely on, rely on the results? I think that's the bigger question. Okay. Thanks so much, Jan, for your uh, uh, last talks that probably will have surely a follow up in the future of the research because it has opened a lot of uh, provocative uh, issue, let me say. At this point, uh, I, I thank all the attendees and the speakers for this very interesting session. And I invite you to stay up again because I think that in another room they will start the virtual beer. So for some of you around the world, it will be night. For others, it's lunchtime. For others, it's morning. In any case, it's always a good time for a beer at Kaise. Ciao, guys. Ciao e grazie. Adriano, I leave the, we close the room and that's it, right? Yes, that's it. Okay. Ciao. Bye, everyone.